So once again, for, and for all who've just joined us, a very warm welcome to this webinar to launch arts, culture and community development. Thanks for coming. It really, really wouldn't be the same without you. It's strange not to be able to see you, but I know that, that many people are here and it's wonderful that you've come. Um, my name's Sarah Bird. I'm the commissioning editor for um, our community development books here at Policy Press, and I'll be sharing, chairing today's session. And I'm delighted to say that we're joined by the book's two editors, Rosie Mead and May Shaw, and also by our guest speaker, Professor Lee, Lynn Siegel. So just a few housekeeping issues before I hand over to our panellists. Um, first of all, we really welcome and encourage comments and questions. Please, you'll see that there's a Q&A function at the bottom of your screens. Please enter your comments and questions in the Q&A function rather than in the chat. Um, and we will have a, a session at the end for addressing those. So we won't answer questions as we're going along. We'll have a Q&A open house at, at, towards the end. Um, with the chat, please use the chat for any technical issues. My colleague Angela will um, be dealing with those with any technical issues that you have as you're going through. Um, whilst I'm speaking about um, technical issues, we have the uh, uh, closed captions enabled on this webinar, which means that you can there's a transcript of my of our spoken words that appear on the screen at the bottom. There's a bottom at the bottom of your screen where you can um, decide whether or not you want to see the captions. So just press hide or show text as, as you prefer. Now, there are many traditions that are followed at book launches. Um, one is a glass of wine and sadly it's a little early and we can't offer you that over Zoom. But um, the other main tradition is to have um, dis discounted copies of the books available for sale. And that's there's no difference for that one. We have and the paperback of arts, culture and community development and indeed of all other books in the Rethinking Community Development series um, will be available for 50% discount between today and the 19th of September. Um, and uh, we'll have links in the chat so that you can see how to go and order. But it's you just need to enter P-O-R-C-D at the checkout um, when you go to our website to order the book. We intend to finish by 12.15 UK time at the latest, which is an hour and a quarter's time. And do please stay to the end if you can, because we have a particular um, wonderful treat to await you at the end. So without further ado, let me hand over to Rosie and May to tell you about the book. And I think, Rosie, you're going first. And you need to unmute yourself. Um, thanks very much to everybody who has joined us today. We're really delighted to have you with us. And we're hoping that this launch a celebration of what has been a collective and collaborative process that has brought this book, Arts Culture, into being will, I suppose, help kind of stimulate a broader conversation about the role and purpose of the arts in society. Um, I'm very mindful that some of you have gotten up very early or stayed up really late in order to join us. And that is really hugely appreciated. Um, in a little while, May will talk about the content of the book and the issues and themes that have been pursued by the authors in their various chapters. So what I'm going to do now is I just want to convey some of the ideas and understandings that have underpinned our commitment to envision for arts, culture and community development, both as a book, but also as a, as a wider living praxis. <clears throat> um, the place where I was reared in in West Limerick has a strong tradition of following the wren the bird who was famously sought after on St. Stephen's Day. It's a tradition that goes way back with musicians gathering on the day after Christmas, traveling from house to house, playing, singing, dancing, and then congregating later in the night in some community center, sports hall or hotel. This is a grassroots architecture of music making that has a presence beyond the Christmas celebrations, emerging in other ways at other times of the year. And as a living tradition, it links together houses, families and individuals across a wide rural hunterland. I'm fairly certain that nobody involved would have thought to describe it as community arts, never mind community development. Not because they lacked the right language or professional expertise to name their own reality, but maybe because as a local arts practice that just was 
and that felt like it always had been. It didn't need to be named in that way. From a distance though, our rural area might look like a cultural desert, one that is assumed to be adrift from the real centers of artistic production, one that needs inclusion in the mainstream of, culture, of the culture industry. But such assumptions are and always have been wide of the mark. And this book both rejects and reveals the poverty of those very kinds of assumptions. The Welsh novelist and cultural theorist Raymond Williams was born 100 years ago this year. Famously, he said that culture is ordinary and we can take it that the arts are ordinary too. They are ordinary in the sense that I have already described, being made and done in ordinary settings. And it is at least partly that ordinariness that means that they should matter for community development. Deceptively simple, Williams's proposition is actually profoundly radical. This is because it challenges those established assumptions about who is creative and who is not, about where art is found, and about what a democratic culture looks like. Cultural democracy means recognizing the already in existence-ness of artistic production in community context, while demanding more resources, more spaces, more recognition for that which may or may not be yet to come. I think that Raymond Williams's radical proposition needs to be constantly reasserted in the face of funding and policy regimes that seek to instrumentalize, commodify, or neutralize the arts. It needs to be asserted in the face of welfare regimes that variously seek to punish or rehabilitate through highly regulated community programs. It needs to be asserted in the face of media that ritualistically denigrate people and places that allegedly don't keep up to speed with the economy people and places that are routinely and cruelly caricatured as failures. What Mark Fisher called the capitalist realism of our age makes it seem as if we are prisoners, locked into a competitive economy where hard choices or trade-offs must be made and accepted. Between hospitals and art centers, between poems and paychecks, unless, of course, those poems can be monetized and turn a profit, unless the art can offer some kind of quantifiable return. Too much of our politics is reduced to such fraudulence and distracting choices. And of course, there are different and better economic and social choices that should become available to us, that must become available to us. However flawed its existing forms, and however disillusioning some of its practices, community development offers a space to expose and to fight for our better alternatives. Its promise that people will be seen and heard offers a visibility that is itself worth fighting for. And as Arundhati Roy reminds us, we can and do use our arts to fight. They can sustain us, give us hope, connect us with others, through our shared lyrics, sounds, movements, music and images, we can fashion and project all manner of future prospects. But crucially, we need to fight for our arts too. The well-known Irish poet, Michael Hartnett, came from the town I was born in. His lyrical language and distinctive voice evoked the town, the countryside around it, and the people who live there. We are lucky to still have his beautiful poems, but maybe we are luckier still to know that somebody who lived our kind of ordinary life, who walked around in the streets we know, could reflect us back to ourselves, that he could go beyond us, that poetry was as much a part of our landscape as it was of more celebrated, more prosperous, more developed places. The poetry and the very possibility of poetry free things up for us. Our freedom captured by Michael Hartnett himself when he wrote, never believe the poem's caged once written down or captured as a wall is with bricks or heaped beneath a roof, trapped by the slaves. For about the last 17 years or so, May and I had been thinking together about how community development's interest 
and in many cases, its lack of interest in the arts can be framed and written about. And in doing so, we have been encouraged and enthused by the writings of others, some of whom have, long, have gone before, and others who are our colleagues and contemporaries. We owe them a huge debt. I also want to mention William Frode de la Faure and Rita Fagan, Emma Bowell and Eddie Noonan, activists and practitioners who have dedicated their working lives and community contexts to the democratization of culture and the arts. May and I have had a joyful collaboration and this book has emerged out of that collaboration. One of the beautiful features of editing a book like this is that the contributors who write for it bring insights, experiences, understandings that we would never have thought, written or even imagined ourselves. They come from different places and disciplines with different influences. And while we might begin with a proposal which suggests or promises certain outcomes, the process itself is always unknowable in advance. We are so grateful that our authors and publishers who have shown such trust and generosity in both making and going with that collective process. Speaking for myself, I could never have predicted how the finished book would look, although I was always confident that we would be proud of it. And here too, I feel the need to assert the importance and value of that kind of unpredictability. For me, one of the most troubling ways that community development and the arts are converging is around the expectation that they deliver the goods, that they become predictable, so that they affect pragmatic and quick solutions to society and capitalism's contradictions. And they are expected to affect those solutions while cloaking themselves in the vestiges of evidence and expertise and constantly demonstrating their economic value. It is urgent that we find ways of flipping that leash of regulation and control, of welcoming back in the unexpected, of taking back the ordinary. At its best, community development presumes that people can and do talk back to that unfair world that we can remake it. This book shows that many of us are already remaking the world by creating culture and experimenting with art forms. Community is being forged through dance, song, circus, broadcast, murals, and performance art. And as James Baldwin tells us, art would not be important if life were not important, and life is important. I'm sorry, actually, but I got cut off there. My link went. But Should actually, carry on now? it was perfect timing. Because Rosie has just oh, finished. Oh. So it's over. Rosie has just finished her, her time and it's over to you to speak. So poor thing. That must be very stressful. Okay. But we can uh, we hear there. and see That's you perfect. and it's your turn. Absolutely. OK. Um, well, um, for those of you who don't know, this book is the seventh title in the Rethinking Community Development series. Uh, and the series is international, cross-generational and cross-disciplinary. As editors, Sarah Banks, Rosie and I set out to critically reconsider what community development means in history, theory and practice. At its best, it offers powerless people an opportunity to act together, to exert greater control over decisions that affect their lives. But at its worst, it can have the effect of what, what one writer described as gilding the ghetto, obscuring rather than addressing real causes of inequality and oppression. Across all of the titles so far, editors and contributors have explored this historical ambivalence and presented material which seeks to rescue community development from neo-colonialist legacies and mindsets and which emphasizes its capacity to talk back to power to look beyond narrow professional models which ser serve to regulate activities in the interests of government policy or increasingly the market. So rather than fall back on formulaic prescriptions for delivering community participation, they explore the democratic potential of diverse community engagements in real time and place. And in this quest, we find many enthusiastic allies, not least in this volume. 
As in previous books, the complex relationship between policy, politics and practice is at the heart of several contributions here, though it obviously manifests itself in different forms in different places. Some chapters highlight the growing contradictions between policy rhetoric and political reality, whilst others expose the gulf between increasingly instrumentalized empowerment practices and the disparities of access to communication on and offline. The tensions involved in developing the kinds of marketable or measurable skills that are deemed necessary by policymakers and funders, while at the same time providing creative opportunities for more critical engagement are explored in many chapters. Community protest and resistance through artistic practice is the focus of others. Some chapters recount how collective action that centers on the arts might destabilize oppressive norms and create opportunities for people to express themselves as they are or might wish to be. Historical models of collective engagement are reappraised in some chapters, whilst in others, organic cultural expressions and historical struggles over rights are seen to inform, enhance, and re-energize. In some cases, documenting history in the making is a radical act of remembering and a resource for the future. The subversive and enlivening practice of open-ended imaginative encounters with groups explored in almost all the chapters offers a direct challenge to the kind of corporate logic which increasingly dominates social and political life across the globe. We're really pleased that the geographic spread is so broad and much of this breadth is captured by the video compilation that follows. It would have been broader still, but some chapters didn't materialize as is often the way with these things. Since we began the project, uh, well, we've all been changed one way or another, not least by the global humbling, as it's called, of COVID. Colleagues everywhere have been working under particularly difficult conditions, some much more pressing than others, and we are really grateful for their commitment to the project. It's been a real clever, uh, pleasure and privilege to work with all of you, and we thank you all for your contribution. Back to Raymond Williams. He argued that to be truly radical is to make hope possible rather than despair convincing. That hope is needed even more now than when we first imagined this book. We hope it will make a small but determined contribution. Now, the video compilation is about to follow and it contains snapshots of most of the chapters and we want to thank the authors for taking the time at, uh, at this particular uh, moment. And in particular, Becky Jeffers from University College Cork, the fantastic work she's done in stitching it all together so creatively. So enjoy. and I'm a founding member of Grupo Bayano. It started back many years ago when we would just dance socially. So we would dance salsa, we would dance soca, we would dance our social dances. But whenever we got together at community events, we would always end up doing some kind of group performance thing together just for fun. We started out with the social dances, but as we learned more about them, we wanted to know about their roots, and that brought us to the traditional dances of the Caribbean. And so each of those dances has their own roots. All of them have roots in West Africa with indigenous influences from those different island nations. So we'll see that there are similarities among the dances, but each one has its own unique character. My name is Reynaldo Rosario. I'm a drummer, a singer, dancer, whatever I have to do during the performance. So normally what happens in Bomba is that the dancers would be uh, you know, dancing to, to, to the beat, to the rhythm, to the song that is playing, and I would kind of like translate it onto the drum. As an artist, and I feel like every artist has, a, has this responsibility. They have to give back to the community that gave to them. So uh, not to forget where you came from and how you came up, right? My name is Yvonne Yokum, and I am a percussionist for Google Bayana. I first got into Moko Jumbies last year, summer of 2017. The history of Moko Jumbies 
originate in West Africa and moved to the Caribbean in times of slavery. And they used to walk on stilts for their ancestors and to be uplifted or upright. What motivates me to keep going is the people and how their reactions and just like when someone sees me doing stilts or playing um, bomba, they like feel like, dang, this, this person's so young and doing like things that grown people can't even do, you know. My favorite part of performing is to see people like their eyes glowing and stuff and like people how they enjoy the music and get inspired. As we go into the future, I'd like to see the Guayano continue to be there for community members that would like to join and want to learn. We've gone into schools and presented and have children come up and say, I want to be, I want to do that, can I do that? We have members and that's how they became a part of our group. In the fourth grade, when we were at their school, come out and joined us. And Grupo Bayano, and we also view ourselves as cultural workers. That means that it's our job to continue the cultural art forms that we learn from our ancestors and the elders in our communities. But it also means that we're here to serve community. We're here to serve when there's a child being celebrated for their birthday. We're here to serve when there is somebody that's having celebrating. So we'd like to continue that, to be there for community, to be able to be a mirror, a place where people can see themselves. And also for Moko Jumbies, we'd love to see more people join and have a larger group of Moko Jumbies available here in Seattle to share and to exchange in parades and in community events. So that idea, uh, wherever people are, as long as they are doing cultural work, then Grupo Bayano continues. I'd like to thank uh, Rosemary Mead and Shaw May for this wonderful book, Arts, Culture, and, and Community Development. Um, my own chapter in this volume is uh, Access to Communications and Resistance in the 21st Century. Um, and that particular chapter actually deals with the whole issue of access to communications, the whole issue of communication rights. And it also includes two examples of resistance. Um, the first one, the Marrakesh Treaty for the Visually uh, Impaired, is basically a treaty that enables uh, people with visual impairments to actually um, copy material without, you know, getting copyright, you know, permissions, right? Um, and the second example is of Rise of Matica, uh, an organization in Mexico involved in setting up community telecommunications projects among indigenous communities. The arts and, and, and communications are two sides of the same coin. And access to arts is just like access to communications in my, in my way of thinking. And there have been some wonderful scholars in, in the UK, for example, people like Raymond Williams, whose life work was about access to art and access to communications. So I think, you know, this book is, a, is, is, is very timely. Um, and I do wish uh, this book every success. Um, and thank you again for this invitation. I'm Kirsty and I'm Ruth. We wrote a chapter titled Queering Community Development in DIY Punk Spaces. It's about prefiguration, seeking to enact the world you wish to see. Punks often place value on do-it-yourself participation, but people who experience oppression can find it harder to participate. We therefore looked at how queer feminist punks work to support participation in community arts. Our main case study is first timers in London. Here's an extract from a great short documentary about it from filmmaker Sophie Cooper. So we have workshops for uh, drums, bass, guitar, um, keyboard and synthesizers, uh, songwriting, beatboxing and vocals creates like a, a more welcoming environment for people who haven't played before to be in a room full of other people who've never played the instrument before, all learning together um, in a very sort of non-elitist way. First timers is really important for people of colour, women, queer people and like generally people who are marginalised within 
both society and within like music scenes as well or aren't expected to take centre stage or be at the front at gigs in that kind of way. I really like the fact that it caters specifically to that audience, gives people a chance to come and experience their first gig in a really supportive environment, one that's like really fun, like kind of low pressure. What First Timers is all about is um, demystifying music, just to show that you don't have to have studied for 10 years before you can play in front of anyone. Hello, my name is Apoena Mano, and I'm recording this short review of the chapter I wrote with Alexis Cortez and Paloma Menezes. Before anything, I'd like to thank Rosie Mead and May Shaw for organizing this wonderful book. The question that moved our chapter reflection was how do popular communities self-represent and resist against unfavorable situations? We explored the relationship between artistic experiences and material culture of the popular sectors and the possibilities of activating imaginaries of community resistance through two urban experiences. I'm going to share some photos and explain our argument. In the first case, we explore the political muralism of Poblacion La Victoria in Santiago de Chile, an emblematic neighborhood known for its organized takeover of land and for its resistance against the Chilean dictatorship. In this case, Muralism has made the memory of the neighborhood graphic based on a dialogue between these two historical experiences of community, the land occupation and the dictatorship. It has generated a discourse that, having emerged from the popular, continues to confront the mechanisms of forgetting that have been and are circulated by the official truth imposed by the compromised democratic transition. In the second case, we observe the paintings produced at Favela Santa Marta, the favela laboratory of the public security pacification policy that preceded sporting mega events in Rio de Janeiro, in Brazil. In this other case, the walls express multiple layers of representation, which can be seen as a synthesis of the disputes and the changes that have occurred in the favela during the last decade. So, these aesthetics express the political production of sensations of economic insecurity and can be regarded as reflecting different groups' ongoing disputes about the territorial dominance. The walls are part of a production of economic insecurity that enables different economic exchanges from and within the favela. Uh, that's it. I'd like to, to thank for this opportunity and I hope you all enjoy our chapter. Thank you. We had this conversation, I suppose, earlier around who benefits from the a practice that is outcome driven. Um, you know, and I suppose the core principle of what we've tried to do is to come together and see where a group of people thinking and talking about power will take us. And that that to me, there's a freedom in that type of a practice, you know, that is increasingly, I suppose, suppressed by the, the, the neoliberal structures in relation to funding and, and evidence and, you know, outcome driven nature, the kind of means and nature of the world we're in. But I think holding that space of not knowing and of being in that space of c collective thinking is, is really what we're fighting for, I suppose. So, it requires great courage, though, to do that, Fiona, I believe, right? Because where we're, our egos are at play, our everything about us, our, our humanity is challenged in, in so many ways by entering into a process like that. And it's not for the faint-hearted. Yeah, I mean, you make that point about um, people might say they want to collaborate, but actually what it takes to truly collaborate is is quite a thing, you know, and there's a very particular, um, because it's not efficient, I suppose, and it's not quick and it's not easy and it requires a lot of personal reflection and conflict and, you know, to really get into a space and unsettle a whole set of things and very, it can be very uncomfortable, but I, I think we've seen the potential when you get into those uncomfortable spaces where they can really take you. Um, and yeah, I mean, in the in the face of kind of rethinking community development as a frame, you know, I think probably that's where our 
that's where we're arguing for that 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 collective potential. But well, we need to find a common language to do that. We need to find a language that we can all understand, that we can all relate to, that we can all get under the belly of and 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 so that we are challenged, so that we are taken on those things that we find difficult. I read a song for the Sheffield Socialist Choir, also called The Power of Song. I can't sing it in full part harmony, unfortunately, but uh, here are a couple of sample verses. They had nothing but their voices, but their voices make them strong, turn despair into defiance, and defiance into song. Some hope, faith and heart, hold the line and hold the fort. Solidarity forever, when our voices weave together into song. Remember Greensburg, Pennsylvania. It's 1914. Miners strike for higher pay. Scabs brought in to break the strike. Miners' wives bar their way. Now here comes the local sheriff and the company police and the women are all jailed for disturbing the peace. Mother Jones, fiery agitator, tells the women, sing, sing all day, sing all night and don't stop for anything. So the women sing their hearts out, on and on, defiantly, till the sheriff's going crazy and he sets the women free. It's the power of song. They had nothing but their voices, but their voices made them strong, turned despair into defiance, and defiance into song. Gave them hope, gave them heart, hold the line and hold the fort. Solidarity forever, when our voices weave together into song. Remember a township called Soweto. It's 1976, rebellions ready to explode and the children of Africa are travelling Freedom's Road. And they sing as they remember those who died in Freedom's cause. And they sing as they protest against apartheid's cruel laws. For their parents it was Sharpville. Now their daughters and their sons are the ones to brave the clubs and the tear gas and the guns and the sound of their singing shakes apartheid's prison wall and apartheid soon will crumble and its citadels will fall it's the power of song they had nothing but their voices but their voices make them strong turn despair into defiance and defiance into song Heart, hold the line and hold the fall. Solidarity forever when our voices weave together into song. Remember the camp of Greenham Common, but that's another story.
Theater of the Oppressed, developed by Brazilian theater director Augusto Boal 40 years ago, is now practiced in over 70 countries. Tonight's play is Shonarme or Golden Girl, and the performers belong to Janushunshkriti. In December 2010, the group completed 25 years of work in rural Bengal. Shonar May was born of the experience of 25 rural women who created it at a workshop. The play depicts a woman who's denied education as a young girl. She is treated as a commodity at the time of marriage. Later, she faces violence and oppression by her husband. Mukade, api demela singela ekotuela inna wa kila audience ite me inda one kila kian ne panivide makaran ne. Api karan ne api eke tulah demela singela deng api auru de ekula demela singela ekotuela inna pulu ana, ayu ogalan te berry. Kian ne ne api inda la penan. Tamil people and Singalese people get together and do a drama. It's uh, it's exceptional. Uh, I would say I can't believe. I couldn't believe my eyes. We didn't know really that we could do those. That helps me to uh, change myself also, uh, to think about, uh, to go beyond, and to give good message to people that uh, ethnicity is not a problem, not a barrier to work together or to live uh, live together. Hello everyone. We'd like to start by thanking you all for your interest in this book and indeed giving us your time at this launch. And of course, uh, thank you to the editors, Rosie and May, for inviting us to write this chapter. Um, as we say in the book itself, we weren't intending for the chapter to be about what it ended up being about. We were kind of forced into it by events that started on the 17th of October 2019. Um, much has changed since then, and indeed many of you have seen the news coming out of Lebanon since October 2019. But weirdly, it feels as though what we wrote in the chapter is not completely irrelevant now, or at least not yet. Um, leaving the political aside for a moment, yet bearing in mind that the aesthetic is also the political, what we wanted to document and reflect on in this chapter was how graffiti, generously conceived of as anything from murals to anonymous scribbles on public walls, lubricated or mediated the shift in the public societal conversations in the country. The aesthetic space has historically done so and continues to do so. Um, these scribbles not only reflect the tone of the societal room, as it were, but they also provide a space, an aesthetic space, for meditative expression. Debates abound over what continues to go on in the country, but after it strong-armed us into writing this chapter in this way, we are left with a bittersweet sense of contentment that we, in our small and humble way, contribute to at least documenting what is beyond doubt a historical, societal and aesthetic moment in Lebanon. So on behalf of Sarah, Celia and myself, uh, thank you to you for being here and to the editors for making this happen. We hope you enjoy the book and we hope you enjoy our chapter. What a wonderful video. Rosie, over to you.
sorry about that. I'm not mastering my microphone very well. Yeah, that video is really gorgeous. And thanks to everybody for contributing to it because we'd not only expected people to write a chapter, we also made them make a video as well. So we really put them through their paces. And, you know, it's just amazing that everybody produced such gorgeous work. Um, so now I want to, I want to introduce somebody very special and I'm so delighted that she's been able to join us today. Um, I first met Professor Len Sigel when she came to Cork in 2004 to deliver the keynote address at the William Thompson weekend. It was our great pleasure to host this generous, warm, intellectually curious activist and scholar and to hear and learn from her reflections on the intersections of feminism and socialism. She immersed herself totally in the weekend, which itself was a slightly ragged mix of theory, activism, poetry and song that ran on nervous energy and no money. So I was so struck by her spirit of comradeship and her sense of fun. Across her life and career, Lynn has always known and encouraged others to know where and what the politics is and why it matters. Lynn is an anniversary, anniversary professor emerita of psychosocial studies at Birkbeck University in London, and she has taught in higher education for over 50 years. She has made an original and distinctive contribution to feminist theory and praxis through her writings, which include is the Future Female, Troubled Thoughts in Contemporary Feminism, Slow Motion, Changing Masculinities, Changing Men, Straight Sex, The Politics of Pleasure, Why Feminism, Out of Time, The Pleasures and the Perils of Aging, and the beautifully named Radical Happiness, Moments of Collective Joy, which couldn't be more relevant to the kinds of arts and cultural practice we are celebrating today. Lynn is also a member of the Care Collective, formed in 2017, Original, originally as a London-based reading group aiming to understand and address the multiple and extreme crises of care. Their Care Manifesto, The Politics of Interdependence, has been rightly described by Naomi Klein as a radiant invitation to transform our economy and society, and I would encourage everybody to read it. It is my absolute pleasure and privilege to welcome Lynn today. Thank you, thank you for those very generous words, Rosie. It's great to be here. It's great to see you again. And I'm simply delighted to be introducing this wonderful new collection. And I love the video about it. As Rosie said, it's a great time for this book to appear, being as it is a centenary of Raymond Williams' birth, born exactly 100 years ago last month. For it was Williams, a socialist to the end of his days, cut short too soon at 66, who knew, as we heard, culture is ordinary, who knew culture is every day. But the cultures of the working class, the poor, the marginalized, are mostly ignored in favor of whatever passes for high culture. Not in this collection, however, quite the opposite. And it was also Williams who knew that culture could serve as a tool for liberation, like, again, all the authors in this book. But he pointed out in Marxism and Literature in 77 that one must always look to human agency and the creative capacities of ordinary people, <clears throat> something Marxists had hitherto largely ignored. But before him, utopian thinkers like William Morris also had much to say about this and the importance of arts and crafts and the crafting of beautiful things generally, not factory produce. Edward Thompson always connect, also connected with this idea in his book on Morris, stressing the importance of the education of desire. But returning <coughs> to Williams, he also always stressed the significance of place and community as we see in this uh, book, especially of smaller regions like his much beloved Wales in developing progressive visions for the future. And in his very last book published posthumously and appropriately called Resources for Hope in 1988, uh, which was written in the rather bleak late 1980s, he wrote, it is not only the movements of peace, ecology and feminism that shift us towards hope, it's also in the vigorous movement of what is called an alternative culture that at its best is always an oppositional culture. New work in theater, film, community, writing and publishing and in cultural analysis. So then turning to this 
book today, Arts, Culture and Community Development, as Rosie and May write, and as we've witnessed in the video, the goal of this collection is to see just how communities can encourage cultural practices in which people collectively engage with each other to make sense of their lives socially and politically, and perhaps and hopefully imagining more caring, egalitarian, democratic futures free from violence. Today, of course, any such activities occur within a continuing neoliberal landscape that we've seen ever more entrenched over the last four decades and continuing today despite those regressive tax cuts. This is still an auster austerity government, tragically. But there we are. Not only has this ushered in an economic order that ensured both the evisceration and outsourcing of welfare resources, and in particular, the most savage cuts to local community budgets, but as well, it's encouraged a way of judging ourselves in terms of our individual market worth. Of course, as Rosie and May say in their introduction, this means we need all the more to resist this rationality, which downgrades, even mocks any collective engagements, encouraging only individual solutions that would place us all one against another, not one supporting each other. So this is why, of course, they also stress that we have to look critically at the very notion of community development when so much of it today is rather compromised, often very compromised, through being outsourced to private companies or large NGOs a few <clears throat> with few ties to participatory democracy. But in these pages, the interest lies in what remains of community projects which genuinely embody alternative democratic practices and possible resistance to market takeovers. As they say, these emergent collectivities may be short-lived, yet in the words of the Mexican activist Gustavo Esteva, manage still to build wide coalitions of the discontented. So, it is looking around the globe for such practices of collective community-based resistance that we find here in this book. Now, as some of you know, and Rosie mentioned <coughs> uh, today with others, I recently was part of producing the Care Manifesto, highlighting the huge crisis of care that currently exists at every level from cradle to grave, with hundreds of thousands, actually a million and a half now, not getting the care they need as elderly people. And the same applies to disability provision. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. But care, as we <coughs> show, is a lot more than hands-on care, important as that is. It's also about caring with, caring about human flourishing at every level, as well as caring about the world around us in such crisis today from climate change which we have been carelessly plundering for so long. Thus, reimagining a caring politics means fully valuing the skills and resources necessary to promote care in all its manifestations. And this very much includes the community building of open, democratic, creative cultural practices, practices for fostering everyone's everyday caring capacities, which we find many more people trying to do today and trying to pursue in their work on culture, media, and the creative industries. And of course, as we saw in all the videos. So let's look at those, a few of those practices on offer here, though I've little time, sadly, to go into them all. I personally felt particularly drawn to the essays in the first section on making and sharing collective meanings through dance, and song and other ways of drawing people into creative, even joyful collectivities. And we saw that again in the video, even when situations are painful and frightening, as sadly they so often are. As someone also who only in my middle age was drawn into acknowledgement of my <coughs> own Jewish ancestry and how that could be used in building collective 
Jewish resistance to the ongoing and very brutal Israeli occupation of the West Bank and siege of Gaza. I was immediately drawn to Leon Russelson's description of the power of song. In fact, in this essay, Leon doesn't mention all the Jews for justice events he sang at, the songs about his father's gentle Jewish militancy, or his eight songs on the continuing horrors in Israel, Palestine, but his songs did help to express and cement our ongoing search for peace in Is Israel, Palestine, uh, which he often sang at in our meetings and gatherings. What Leon does mention, and I really do recall as well from my own life, is his song about the Trico women workers striking for equal pay in the windscreen wipers factories in West London back in the 1970s. That song expressed both these women workers' determination, but also the support which drew feminists then, including me and others, to the gates of that particular West London picket in the late 70s. And a strike also that was won. Other songs Leon mentioned, such as the famous Bread and Roses song, paying homage to the Chicago women's strike over a century ago, has been a rallying cry, a rallying cry for working women's struggles ever since, year after year, right down over the century. And then dance, dance as we saw. I love the chapter on dance with dancers. Antonia Dada and Sharon Cronin quote from Paul Freire, the, the earliest language of the body. It's definitely a language we in the UK don't use enough. And I'd love to see it more in our community arts initiatives, especially useful, of course, for bonding older people and in particular, older people with Parkinson's and MS. We definitely need to see more community funding going into that. I was also looking at some of the fine picket line dancing and singing, keep, keeping spirits up during the Los Angeles teachers strike a couple of years ago. What do we want when our schools are under attack? What do we want? What do we do? We fight back. Yes, and in the very first entry of this collection, we read about the Chicago-based group Bayano, which we also saw especially welcoming towards African-Americans and other indigenous people, and particularly useful, they write, in reviving community spirits when most needed as in the aftermath of Hurricane Maria. More hurricanes today, so I imagine they're busy. In other chapters, negotiating the challenges and paradoxes of practices and policies and community arts projects, it was fascinating for me to read Jennifer Spiegel's chapter about circus activities of jugglers, acrobats, skating and clowning that was encouraged in the Montreal-based Cirque du Soleil, Circus of Sunshine, as we might call it, which was originally founded by street performers from 1979 and the early 80s. But they've since been funded by the Canadian Arts Council for years with collective community goals to nurture self-esteem and trust in all their performers, as well as to encourage engaged citizenship. It all sounds wonderful. However, Spiegel knows there can be a downside now. The 1970s community based arts practices emerged from various revolutionary movements, but by the 21st century, there were worries that such funded projects were being used as cosmetic fixes for in the light of cuts to community infrastructures, helping people to adapt or even improve themselves for the market rather than to resist social inequalities. So Spiegel is hoping to see the growth of more street-based countercultures of bodily expression and social circuses, some of which she sees, for instance, in Latin America, which managed to resist the power of corporate capital to take over and tame such collective practices by emphasizing only things like developing pre-employability skills. But overall, observing surface productions in the most diverse of communities, Spiegel does see such collective embodied expressions of having at least the potential to suggest 
alternative forms of social relationality. Even more dramatically, as we saw, this collection closes with the use of theater for building peace in situations of conflict, in this case, in troubled areas of India and Sri Lanka by Sri Lankan scholar Nulanjana Premaratna. The hefty cultural effort here is to assist in people's understanding of structural violence and help to create a wider sense of shared community belonging, both through dramatic artistic collaborations and of course, through engagement with audiences, hoping to overcome, help them overcome their complicities in violence and oppression by opening up the possibilities for envisaging different shared futures. It's a startling challenge. So finally then to return to my own special topic of care, I think we can agree that we are never going to be able to build more caring, creative and participatory communities without expanding our collective cultural resources at every level, attentive always to placing vectors of resistance against patterns of accommodation. Hence, this is genuinely a great anthology for our time, and I hope to see a lot more like it, um, along with more collective cultural expression of every possible configuration as we share the crucial lessons of our basic interdependence and our need to celebrate our distinct ties and connectedness to each other. In particular, we need to look out for and support more cultural outlets for revealing and encouraging the cultural expression of all who remain most silenced, excluded and marginalized today. For instance, seeking to resist the structural violence of our government, which apparently prefers once to let asylum seekers drown in our oceans rather than listen to their stories of courage and survival. So much to do with the struggle for cultural resources, one of the keys. Thank you very much. Wow, Lynn, thank you so much. I so wish we could all clap you all together. That was an amazing talk. A, a call to arms, um, celebratory but challenging at the same time. Oh, gosh, I'm, I'm sure I can speak on behalf of all of, look, there we are, the panelists are applauding. So I can speak on behalf of everybody, I think, to say thank you so much for an extraordinary talk. And I'm very glad to say that we will have a recording of this um, webinar available afterwards. So we'll, we, you won't lose it and you can share it with your friends. <laughs> So moving on to, oh look, clapping. There's more clapping. I've just got to wait for the clapping to subside. What a great, great thing. But let's move on to, to question and answers. We have, and comments, we have 10 minutes. Um, if you do have questions, do put them in the q and I'll start with ones that are already in the Q&A. Um, but if you have more questions and comments, please put them in the Q&A rather than in the chat and I will um, share, them, share them now. So. May and Rosie, perhaps you'd like to unmute yourself so you can answer the um, questions. And we had a question from Sarah. The chapters show an amazing variety of creative and political arts-based action, place-based and issues-based. Do you think professional community development workers have a role in stimulating and supporting this, or is it best to leave local people and communities and artists to organize themselves? I don't know which one of you wants to take that first. Or indeed, Lynn. I'll let the others, um, I was looking at the questions. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it's like me looking at the questions as well. Um, I mean, it depends on the context. It, it comes back partly to the, one of the things I was saying at the start of uh, introducing the chapters, which is how you sort of conceive of community development and those kinds of practices and what kind of possibilities they offer and what kind of constraints they operate under. You know, um, so the, the, I think the scope for kind of open engagement, if you like, with uh, communities around 
issues they may may want to raise has you know has decreased you know it's constrained to quite an extent that comes up constantly across the book but those spaces are still there and I suppose the answer is whether you leave people alone as it were and let them get on with it or help lies in how you are able to sort of deploy community development in particular kind of context if you're trying to kind of make people conform to some sort of managerial outcome based kind of work then you're actually getting in the way there's no question but i think on the edge sometimes things can be provided in ways that sometimes get around some of those sorts of constraints but i think it's sort of minutiae kind of work it's really kind of on the edges and it's I think it offers something that's quite important, but I think that people who are involved in that kind of work have to be have to be very determined to do it. Do we still have professional community development workers? I would have thought we didn't have many of them left. I mean, it's been cut, 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 cut. I can't think in Islington <laughs> where on earth we would have them. But I, 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 and if we did, you know, we could all be there, sort of. <laughs> relating to them and telling them about our projects and what we'd like funding for. But I mean, we've actually seen cuts just in the open spaces in all the places where we want um, uh, uh, our energetic community life to go on. You know, our government's been busy trying to privatize it and sell it off to the corporations, hasn't it? So I didn't know. It could be an important question, but I would, um, I'd like to see more, more professional community development workers because I don't know that there are too many, but you'll have to tell me, are there, Rosie? <laughs> yeah, I mean, there, there certainly still are in the Irish context, but I think what's happened has been that the focus of their work has, in terms of policy, has, has changed dramatically. And perhaps in the Irish context, maybe 20 years ago, there was much more openness. There was much more, you know, not absolutely democratic, and it was always part of a policy context, but a certain, you know, you know, openness to experimentation. I think one of the things that came with austerity and the Great Recession was this kind of clamping down on those kind of open spaces. Um, so yeah, so there are some, but I, I think there is a real way that they are circumscribed in, in terms of their scope for action. Um, so in terms of, of Sarah's question, I think sometimes is the answer. Sometimes it's absolutely appropriate for community development workers to engage with communities around, around these issues and around these practices because policy needs to change. You know, resources need to be spent in better ways. There needs to be, you know, new opportunities for people to articulate themselves publicly in the media, not just internally to their own communities, but externally. And I think community workers could play a really good role in that. But on the other hand, sometimes it's not appropriate at all, because as May says, sometimes it can be a colonialist impulse of trying to improve or trying to make people better in certain kind of prescribed ways. And I think we should be resisting that. And I think other one of the problems sometimes is when people, the people see themselves as being the objects of community development, there can be an inherent stigma associated with that as well. You know, you know like that this gets done to poor people in poorer places. So I think that one of the things we were trying to do in the book was to say that this stuff is happening anyway, you know, irrespective of whether policymakers or professionals are interested in it, it is going on. Sometimes policymakers and professionals get interested in it, and sometimes, but a lot of the time they don't. And if we're talking about participatory culture and cultural democracy, we need to recognize all of those, all of those possibilities simultaneously. Thank you, Rosie. And in fact, I have we have a quick follow up question um, from Catherine Ford. Um, do you perceive a role for provision of community arts focused training on community development programs in higher education institutes and other institutions? Yeah, I think it, I, th I think it would be really I think it would be certainly really great if there was more of a focus on 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 community arts. Um, so I think that would be really, you know, because it certainly opens up questions in different kind of ways. And, that, and like one of the things I think we're really trying to show with this book is that it's not just arts don't just matter for what they tell us in terms of concepts and ideas. They're very form, the very ways that they get us to inhabit our body. They, 
the way that they encourage us to think beyond the ordinary, they're important in their own right. They don't have to be for any greater purpose of like reducing employment and employment or, you know, improving healthcare, which is increasingly what the expectation is. That being able to recognize that we are embodied people, that we we sing, we dance, we communicate with each other through these in material, through these media, that's an important, that's also a valid an equally valid way of being a human in the world. Um, and I think that that's, so that's also, I think how we can, it's not just that we teach those things, but it's how we teach them and the kind of multiple recognitions that go on with how, how they are taught and how they are approached within, within kind of university and third level settings, I think. Um, uh, I've taught at Birkbeck for the last 20 years and uh, every official outreach uh, project was totally instrumental in trying to get, um, more students for Birkbeck, but we did have centers, you know, like we'd have the gender and sexuality center and so on, which did do important work, I think, in talking about, you know, women's impoverishment and issues of trans and, and so on. So that there are ways of reaching out, but I would think in general, um, what's of most interest are places where there are alternative community hubs. I mean, in Dundee and, in Birmingham, I've heard of these alternative community hubs, which um, are very much, I think, coming from the outside or some particular person who, you know, is the focus for trying to get together and reach out to the most marginalised or perhaps um, um, refugees and others, and then desperately trying to get funding. That It usually seems to go that way around, that there's someone uh, working with and trying to um, get crucial resources for necessary projects that you know might be theatre might be anything to reach out to others that i've often read about that doesn't really i mean it, it's not officially organized from within local authorities but very much a few individuals already engaged in that sort of work with the homeless with addiction and so on and then as i say desperately trying to get funding and very much then um, involving cultural um, projects to enable the engagement of more people and to reach more people and bring them into feeling just a part of their communities, which, you know, so many people are just lost in loneliness and isolation, aren't they? And it's not just COVID, though COVID will have increased it. They're, you know, we suffer from huge problems, as we know, of mental crisis and loneliness that um, I think, you know, some people will be in very particular ways working to reach those people and then at the very same time, you know, desperately trying to get funding to find ways to um, uh, expand and, uh, and um, make more pleasurable the activities which they're able to do with marginalized people. Thank you. Gosh, we do have a couple more questions coming in, but I think I, I well, gosh, we're twelve ten, and we did say that we'd finish at twelve fifteen. So I think that it's thank you for all of your questions, um, and thank you for your responses, and thank you all for coming to an extraordinary launch. Now it's not the end of it because I'm now going to hand over to May, who is going to say something about what is coming next for the next few minutes. I don't want to talk it up too much for it, which will become obvious to you in a minute, but that we are going to finish this launch with a song sung by me, which thank God uh, I recorded in advance since I've had real trouble with my uh, technology this morning. Um, I just wanted to say that the song, which is called Your Daughters and Your Sons, uh, was written by Tommy Sands, who's a fantastic songwriter from Northern Ireland, where I also come from. And you'll see that behind me is a banner, but you can't read it. Um, but I just wanted to say what's on that banner. Um, left Turns, it's a Left Turns banner. And left Turns was an organization of trade unions, community groups and uh, performers, which supported community action around all kinds of issues. Um, and on the banner is a quote. We had this banner up at every uh, performance that we did. And it says, the people are on the march. 
they must have songs to sing. And I can't think of a better note on which to finish. Thank you very much all. I will now try to share my screen for the last time. And yes, thanks all very, very much again for coming. Gosh, well, for anyone who is still here, in fact, there are 44 people, there's lots of people still here. So I thought I wasn't going to say anything at the end, but that was so beautiful. Thank you, May. Thank you all very, very much for coming. That was such a brilliant webinar. Don't forget to order the book for 50% discount. And yeah, thank you all.
Yeah, just thank you, everybody. It's been wonderful. And particular thanks to Lynn for joining us and going through the book in such a beautiful way. And it's been an absolute pleasure. And there's fabulous comments and fabulous questions. And just we we'll really, really appreciate the support and encouragement. And also all of the wonderful contributors to the book. They have been absolutely amazing and their collegiality has been remarkable particularly as a lot of this was going on during the time of COVID and the pandemic. So they need a serious clap and a kind of sense of affirmation for what they've done. They've been absolutely astounding. Thank you, everyone. Enjoy the rest of your day, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Thanks for coming. Bye -bye. Thank you.